Hello everyone and welcome back to this special broadcast where I've been reading through Gipp's Understandable History of the Bible by Brother Samuel C. Gipp and today we're going to continue through chapter 6 titled The Witnesses and we're going to start with Erasmus, the greatest of editors which is on page 109 and go all the way to page 118 stopping at uh, page 118 so cover all that and then we'll stop on that page so amen. All right, so let me get started here, and this again is, um, we're continuing through chapter 6, titled The Witnesses with Erasmus, the greatest of editors from Gipp's Understandable History of the Bible by Samuel C. Gipp, Th.D. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Erasmus, the greatest of editors. We have seen what an imaginary editor would go through in the process of examining the extant witnesses, and defining the original text. Now we'll study how we got our Textus Receptus, um, the Greek text that is closest to the original and is the basis for or from which the King James Bible was translated. And he says, when I was that editor, uh, uh, excuse me, let me repeat that. When I say that the editor assembled it, you know, you now know what he had to go through to identify it. Amen. <clears throat> the man responsible for the Texas Receptus was this, this, uh, let me see if I can pronounce that, Decidorus uh, Erasmus, who lived from 1466 to 1536. He may well be called the original editor. Erasmus was a genius he was, without argument, the most learned man of the 16th century. Erasmus was born in Rotterdam in 1466 and died in 1536 at the age of 70. This is an amazing long life for someone who lived through the age of the great plagues of Europe. He was the son of a Roman Catholic priest. Both of his parents died from the plague while Erasmus was just a lad. He had a brother and two boys were, excuse me, he had a brother, and the two boys were placed in the care of an uncle after the death of their parents. The uncle did not want the boys and promptly sent them off to a monastery just to be rid of them. Then Erasmus's destiny was sealed long before he could ever have a say in the matter. Mm. Destined against his will to be a Roman Catholic priest, Erasmus chose to become an Augustinian on the sole attribute that they were known to have the finest of libraries available in Europe. This was where he could feed his insatiable desire for knowledge. His behavior was somewhat bizarre by Augustinian standards. He refused to keep vigils never hesitated to eat meat on Fridays, and, though ordained, chose never to function as a priest. The Roman Church had captured his body, but quite apparently his mind and heart were still unfettered. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> All right. Continuing on about Erasmus, it says, He is known to history as one of the most prolific writers of all times and all of Europe hung on his words. Erasmus was a constant and verbal opponent of the many ex excesses of his church. He berated the paper, papacy, the priesthood, and the monks for their overindulgences. He stated that the monks would not touch money, but that they would, were not so scrupulous concerning wine and women. Hmm. Con he constantly attacked clerical uh, concubinage and the cruelty with which the Roman Catholic Church dealt with so-called heretics. He is even credited with saving a man from the Inquisition. One of his many writings consisted of a tract entitled Against the Barbarians, which was directed against the over overt wickedness of the Roman Catholic Church. He was a constant critic of Pope Julius and the papal monarchy. He often compared the crusade-leading 
Pope Julius to Julius Caesar, he is quoted as saying, How truly is Julius playing the part of Julius? <laughs> he also stated, This monarchy of the Roman pontiff is the pest of Christendom. He advised the church to get rid of the Roman see, when a scathing satire in which Pope Julius was portrayed as going to hell, written in an enemy, um, was circulated. It was fairly common knowledge that its author was Erasmus. Uh, thus, it is plain to see that only a dishonest person would attempt to portray Erasmus as a good Catholic. The Pope attempted to bribe Erasmus into silence by offering him a bishopric, the wealth and power of such a position in medieval Europe is unimaginable today. Erasmus uh, rejected the bribe flat and continued his attacks undeterred. The Europe in which Erasmus was raised was vastly different than the one we know today. It was a rigidly classed society. The common people were peasants and served the upper levels of society. Many men entered the priesthood because it afforded them a luxurious lifestyle in spite of their vow of poverty and gave them great power over the commoners. Erasmus was an oppo opponent of this system. He was called a humanist because he sought to alleviate the lowly position of the common man. The term humanist did not carry the same meaning that it does today when it describes one who exalts man's achievement as opposed to God. This is no different than the change that, that has taken place in the biblical term liberal. A careful reading of Proverbs 11.25, Isaiah 32, 5-8, and 2 Corinthians 9.13 will reveal that the term liberal in Bible days was a positive title, right? But it is... It has been stolen and used to describe those who wish to tax, control, and oppress the common people of today. These are the very same people Erasmus fought against in his desire to set the common people free. The only Bible available to Catholic Europe was possessed and controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. This was, of course, a warmed-over edition of the corrupt Alexandrian text. The true text of scripture has had been ravaged by years of persecution by that same Catholic Church. Erasmus sought to correct this deficiency and provide the common people with a copy of the true text of scripture. Erasmus is quoted as saying, Do you think that the scriptures are fit only for the perfumed? He also stated, I venture to think that people that anyone who reads my translation at home will profit thereby. He boldly stated that he uh, longed to see the Bible in the hands of the farmer, the tailor, the traveler, and the Turk. Later, to the astonishment of his upper-class colleagues, he added, the masons, the prostitutes, and the pimps to that declaration. Thus, he began, began a project that he could never know would t touch the lives of you and me almost five centuries later. Amen. Uh, before beginning his work, R Erasmus collected all the available witnesses to the text. Then, just as our imaginary editor did, he carefully examined them to determine which were reliable and which were to be rejected as tainted. <clears throat> Erasmus completed his work and published his Greek text in 1516. He later refined this and a second edition was published in 1519. His first two editions did not contain 1 John 5, 7, although the reading had been found in many non-Greek texts dating back as early as 150 AD. Erasmus desired to include the verse but knew the conflict that would rage if he did so without at least one Greek manuscript for authority. Following the publication of his second edition, which 
like his first, consisted of both the Greek New Testament and his own Latin translation. He said that he would include 1 John 5, 7 in his next edition if just one Greek manuscript could be found which contained it. Two were found and presented to him, so he included the verse in his third edition of 1522. Opponents of the reading today errantly change or charge errantly charge that the two manuscripts found had been specially produced just to oblige Erasmus's request, but this charge has never been validated and was not held at the time of Erasmus's work. He later published a fourth edition in 1527 and his fifth and final edition in 1535, a year before his death. So steadfast was his stand against the corruptions of the Roman Catholic Church that he even refused to incorporate the official Latin text of Scripture, Jerome's Vulgate, into his work. Instead, he placed his own Latin translation beside his rendition of the Greek. The Roman Catholic Church criticized his works for his refusal to use Jerome's Latin translation, but Erasmus was unmoved. He claimed that Jerome's Latin was inaccurate. He disagreed with it in two vital areas. Number one, he detected that the Greek text Jerome used for his translation had been corrupted as early as the 4th century. He knew that Jerome's translation had been based solely on the Alexandrian manuscript Vaticanus, written early in the 4th century, because Jerome used the corrupted text of Alexandria, Egypt, Erasmus knew that it too was unreliable just like today's modern translations based on this same corrupted text. Number two, he also differed with Jerome on the translation of certain passages which were vital at, to the claimed authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Jerome rendered Matthew 4.17 thus, Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Erasmus saw that this translation added authority to the Roman Catholic practice of confession, and instead rendered the verse be penitent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, Erasmus was also a staunch defender of both Mark 16, 9-20, and John 8, 1-12, with the zeal which our modern-day scholars cannot seem to find. With the publication of Erasmus's Greek text, Europeans now had access to the true text of Scripture. It didn't take long to have a major effect on the events of the day. Martin Luther welcomed it with open arms and used it to translate the, his German Bible. This is the Bible that God used to speak, uh, excuse me, to, to spark the anti-Catholic Reformation in Europe. After his death, Erasmus' text was revised by men like Robert Stephanus, four editions, and Theodore Beza, ten editions. It was Beza's fifth edition that was to be the basis for our English King James Bible. Erasmus's text was so accepted that it was used by the, the El Elzevir uh, brothers in their first editions of the Greek New Testaments, Testament um, be published in 1624 and 1633. In the preface of the 1633 edition, they wrote, You have, therefore, the text now received by all, in which we give nothing changed or corrupt. From 1633 on, this text became uh, known as the re Received Text, or Textus Receptus in Latin, and that name has stuck ever since. <clears throat> Erasmus's Greek text and personal writings were devastating to the Tortillarian Catholic Church. He was so hated by his church that in 1559, 23 years after his death, Pope Paul the Fourth, uh, fourth put his uh, writings 
on the index of books forbidden to be read by Roman Catholics. Next is the topic of taking sides. The surviving manuscript witnesses to the Greek New Testament text which we now possess are found to generally fall into two groups of texts. The vast majority of manuscripts agree with the Texas Receptus upon which our King James Bible is founded. This is the true text from Antioch which we studied in the previous chapter. A small group of manuscripts which have proved to be unreliable originate from Alexandria, Egypt and are the general basis for all modern translations. Some scholars have tried to define a third classification which is called the Western family, but most of these manuscripts fit well into one of the two families already mentioned. Therefore, we will dismiss the so-called Western family and deal with the two predominant text families. This is where we begin to find some major problems. We find that these two texts disagree consistently concerning the major doctrines and minor points of truth. They are found to disagree on readings concerning the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, the blood atonement, Christ's second coming, the deity of Christ, and many other fundamental Christian doctrines. In fact, the alterations are so obviously hostile to the Bible's fundamental doctrines that it cannot be argued that such changes were ever were either excuse me that such changes were either innocent or accidental. It is for this reason that we must examine our witnesses to determine if their testimony is accurate, that's God's text, or if they are fun, fraudulently misleading, and that's Satan's text. Remember our ground rules. So we must remember the ground rules from previous chapter, or previously in the book. All right, next uh, topic is titled The Good Guys. The first of the two of these two texts, which we will examine, is the majority text. Uh, this is basically another name for the Texas Receptus, which we have just studied. This is the text which we will be which will be found to uphold those major Christian doctrines which are so vital to our fundamental beliefs. It is called the majority text because it is the text found in the overwhelming majority of extant manuscripts. The uh, majority uh, text has been known throughout history by several names. It has been known as the Antiochian text, the Byzantine text, the Imperial text, the traditional text, and the Reformation text, as well as the majority text. To name a few, this text culminates uh, in the Textus Receptus, or Received Text, which is the basis for the King James Bible, which we know also as the Authorized Version. Let's see here, I'm trying to see something. Alright. Making sure I didn't miss anything here. Alright, okay, so continuing on. Uh, it says, I do uh, not... Excuse me, he says, I do not desire to add one more name to the list, but in the interest of finding the most accurate term to describe this text, and due to its universal reception uh, by Orthodox Christians throughout history, we shall refer to this text as the universal text. Dr. Edward F. Hills justifies this choice when he states, There is now greater reason than ever to believe that the Byzantine text, which is found in the vast majority of the Greek New Testament manuscripts and which was used well nigh universally throughout the Greek church for many centuries, is a faithful reproduction of the original New Testament and is the divinely appointed standard by which all New Testament manuscripts and all divergent readings must be judged. And then he writes, Emphasis mine in uh, uh, the 
parentheses, and this is uh, found in Fuller David, uh, his book here, David Fuller's book, Which Bible, uh, published by Grand Rapids International Publications, Grand Rapids, 1970, first edition, pages 51 and 52. Amen. <clears throat> All right, continuing on, it says, we designate this text with the term universal because it represents the text found in the majority of extant manuscripts and was used universally by the early church. These manuscripts represent the original autographs. Professor Hodges of Dallas Theological Seminary explains the manuscript tradition of an ancient book will, under any but the most exceptional conditions, multiply in a reasonably regular fashion with the result that the copies nearest the autograph will normally have the largest number of descendants. And that's also uh, found, uh, it says Ibid, page 21, so that means the book that was mentioned on the previous page, I believe. And continuing on, it says, even Hort was forced to admit this, as Professor Hodges points out in his footnote. This tr tr truism was long ago concealed, or excuse me, conceded. So this truism was long ago conceded, and in parentheses it says, somewhat grudgingly, by Hort, a theologic, uh, theoretical, excuse me, theoretical presumption indeed remains, uh, yeah, remains that a majority of extant documents is more likely to represent a majority of ancestral documents at each state of transmission than ver vice versa. <clears throat> uh, and it says, I bid page 21 also. All right, and it says, Professor Hodges uh, then concludes, thus the majority text upon which the King James Version is based has in reality the strongest claim possible to be regarded as an authentic representation of the original text. This claim is quite independent of any shifting consensus of scholarly judgment about its readings and is based on the objective reality of its dominance in the transmissional uh, history of the New Testament text. And he writes again, emphasis mine, in parentheses, and this is I bid page 21 also. Uh, next, it says, when these men are saying excuse me, what these men are saying is simply that any corruption to the New Testament text would obviously have to begin some time after the original autographs were completed, or there would be no originals to corrupt. If the originals and the first corruptions of those originals multiplied at the same rate, the correct text would always be found in the majority of manuscripts. Add to this the fact that the Orthodox Christian Church would reject the corrupted manuscripts and refuse to copy them, and we would find that the correct text would be in the vast majority of manuscripts, universally accepted as authentic, while the corrupt text would be represented by an elite minority. These are exactly the circumstances which exist in the manuscript evidence available today. Fuller records, Miller has shown that the traditional text predominated in the writings of the Church Fathers in every age from the very first. And then a note down here, this is uh, found in David Fuller's book, True or False, Grand Rapids International Publications, Grand Rapids, uh, 1973, page 264. Continuing on. The universal text traveled north from Jerusalem to Antioch, the gateway to Europe. It is quite likely that some of the original manuscripts were even take or even written in Antioch. From there, it was translated into numerous other languages, such as Syrian. And note down here, it says, uh, note 29, there are still 350 copies of the Syrian Peshito, in existence today as a testimony to this widespread usage in the years since 150 AD. 
So again, uh, such as Syrian and Latin and crossed into Europe. This text then crossed the English Channel upon arrival in England. It was ready for translation into the language through which God has chosen to spread his gospel to the entire world. That's English. Amen. English. And I believe that's where we will stop today. Hold on a second. Yep, so that's where we stop today. And next time, I'll continue in this chapter uh, with the topic, The Original Vulgate. Amen. So that will be on page 118. That's where we left off. So I'll pick up on page 118 next time with the original Vulgate from chapter 6, The Witnesses. And that again is uh, from Gipp's Understandable History of the Bible by Samuel C. Gipp, Th.D. And this is the cover of the book. And you can order that on the internet and uh, get this copy. Or you can get the newer uh, edition, which I believe he's added some more stuff to it. Amen. So uh, check that out if you want to get your own copy of it. Amen. All right. Well, that'll be it for today. So thanks for watching and uh, be back, Lord willing, next time. So till then, may the Lord richly bless you and have a great rest of your uh, evening, day or whatever time of day you're watching. Amen. Bye for now.